There is only a finger's difference between a wise man and a fool. Few philosophical figures have passed into legend quite like Diogenes. He was the vagabond Greek philosopher who lived in a jar and went to the toilet in the streets of Athens. The man who scorned social convention chose to be a beggar and spent his days literally insulting people into doing philosophy. He thought that Plato was full of it, that rich men were morons, and he disrespected Alexander the Great to his face. Suffice to say, we have a lot to learn from him. Get ready to discover the philosophical way to rebel against society, why dogs are wiser than people, and why we should all be a little bit more patient with irritating contrarians. Before we get started, I just want to give a shout out to the book The Dangerous Life and Ideas of Diogenes the Cynic, published by Oxford University Press. It is a fantastic work if you want to explore Diogenes' philosophy further. But without further ado, let's dive into the mind of the ultimate critic and see what he has to say about our own lives. 1. Renunciation The Danish philosopher Søren Kierkegaard used to talk about the night of infinite resignation. This is an incredibly complex and disputed idea, but Kierkegaard partly meant this figure to represent giving up our desires and wishes for this world. So a night of infinite resignation might love someone very dearly and also recognize that they will never be together, but they will become resigned to this fact. They are adept at absorbing the troubles of the world because they can accept their fate in a moment, transforming an earthly desire into its abstract, infinite and eternal form. But Diogenes was perhaps even more extreme than this because he gave up all worldly goods with a scornful laugh. He derided all of the paltry desires of his fellow Greeks and chose to live in abject poverty. This was despite the fact that he had ample skill as an administrator. He could easily find work if he wanted. But he saw the accumulation of even a small morsel of wealth as the mark of a fool. Where Aristotle might teach of moderation and the golden mean, Diogenes instead spoke of total renunciation. Where Epicurus said we should be thankful for ample food, water, and a roof over our heads, Diogenes said that even these basic things were needless luxuries. He chose to live in a ceramic jar and begged for his dinner. The lengths he would go to to avoid any semblance of comforts could actually become quite comical. He would clasp his naked body against frozen statues in winter and roll in the scorching sand at the height of summer. Every one of his actions seemed to reject the pleasures he saw everyone else indulging in. At first, this philosophy can seem sort of absurd. Unlike a lot of others, Diogenes was not suffering in the moment for some greater reward down the line. He was not like the student that puts in gruelling study hours in the hopes of acing their exam, or even a martyr of religion who faces death in service to their faith. Instead, Diogenes is sacrificing his comfort because he simply sees no value in it. In fact, he holds it in deep contempt and views it as a potential limitation on his liberty. Diogenes and the later Cynic movement had an incredibly unusual view of the world. They held that there were three types of being, animals, humans, and gods. Gods they saw as beyond our reach, so they didn't really concern themselves with them. And they also held that animals were, in many ways, a higher form of being than humans. This was because Diogenes thought animals had fundamentally healthier minds. Whereas Plato looked at man and saw our unique rational and imaginative capacity, Diogenes focused on how this caused us immense anxiety. He looked at the dogs in the street and saw that they were often perfectly happy. If they were in no immediate danger, then they seemed at peace, both with the world and with themselves. You never see a dog worrying about current affairs or whether they'll ever find love. You largely see them contenting themselves with scavenging a little food before curling up and promptly dozing off. At least this was Diogenes' assessment. If you look carefully, you can almost see the seeds of a Schopenhauerian view here. Diogenes also thought that the more a person gave up, the freer they became. He saw possessions as trapping you to one particular place and one particular role. If you had stable employments, then that tied you to a job. If you had lots of money, then you had to hire guards to prevent it being stolen. He would berate me for having and working on this YouTube channel, and instead advise me to give up all of my belongings and live in poverty, which paradoxically he took to constitute ultimate freedom. It is honestly really strange to see destitution viewed like this, and I'm certainly not fully convinced of Diogenes' point, at least not to the extent that he clearly is. But the important thing to take away here is this link between renunciation and freedom. Diogenes thought that the more we had, the more we would desire, and the more we desire, the less freedom we would have, because our actions would be guided by that desire. So he thought the only way to be truly free was to own nothing and live, as he put it, like a dog, taking whatever nature and fate brought you. 
We might not want to go quite as far as Diogenes here, and it seems sort of condescending to think of poverty as a blessing, but the general thrust of his underlying message has a lot of wisdom in it. It is often thought that the majority of suffering is caused by not having enough. But Diogenes instead thought it stemmed from desiring more than you have. And as long as what you had was your next meal, he truly thought you should not want any more than this. And he did practice this worldview, living in the streets without shelter, while referring to himself as the richest person he knew. Perhaps his extreme example can alert us to where our own appetites have gone astray and where we might want to rein in our wishes to a more ascetic lifestyle. According to Diogenes, not only will we be wiser, but we will also be freer. But all of this ignores what I take to be one of the most important pillars of Diogenes' philosophy, and perhaps what he is best known for today, his harsh critique of sensible society. If you want to help me make more videos like this, then consider subscribing to either my email list or my Patreon. The links are in the description. 2. The Anti-Society Man it is almost a tradition amongst philosophers to take aim at the society in which they live, or to predict its downfall. Socrates thought that many Athenians of his day were full of rubbish and in dire need of his philosophical correction, while Nietzsche called the dominant moral system of 19th century Europe dangerous and backwards. But perhaps no one was quite as brutal a societal critic as Diogenes the Cynic. Where other people saw the great Greek city-state as a bastion against the horrors of the wilds, Diogenes saw it as an endless stream of arbitrary limitations on human liberty. In one notable anecdote, Diogenes met the legendary Greek conqueror Alexander the Great, back when he was just the king of Macedon. Hearing of this philosopher who lived on the street as a living symbol of societal rebellion, he decided to test the vagabond's resolve. Seeing Diogenes laying there destitute, he offered him anything the man desired, and Diogenes replied he simply wanted Alexander to stop blocking his sunlight. In another tale, Diogenes was taken prisoner by Alexander's father, Philip of Macedon, and he treated the old king so disrespectfully that Philip was both shocked and amused, setting the philosopher free as a testament to his bravery and consistency. For Diogenes saw through most of the values of ancient Hellas. In his eyes, they were shared delusions. Why should he care whether someone is king of Macedon or leader of Athens or even the emperor of Persia? For Diogenes, no societal distinction mattered in the slightest. In some ways, this makes him a remarkably modern philosopher. Remember that Diogenes is a contemporary of Aristotle, who argued that some people were just naturally naturally superior to others, while Plato argued that some people just deserved privileged positions in society. But Diogenes would consider this ridiculous. And this was very much in line with the cynic philosophy of respecting the natural properties of humanity above all others. Diogenes would probably say that in a pre-civilized world there were no distinctions between king and peasant, free man and slave. These labels may now describe the amount of power that one person happens to hold over another, but they are not normatively or morally relevant. Diogenes almost seemed to take pride in treating everyone with equal respect and equal disdain. We might call him an equal opportunity hater, or an indiscriminate bastard, depending on your point of view. And this rejection of what most of Hellenic society viewed as good and proper stretched to all aspects of his life. Diogenes lived as a beggar, and this was partly because of his vow of poverty, but also because it was considered to be the lowest rung of Athenian society. In much of ancient Greece, citizens were bound together through the idea that they were all contributing towards a shared whole, that is, the city-state. However, beggars were viewed as separate to this arrangement. The ancient Greeks largely saw these mendicants as parasites, and they were frequently beaten, spat on, and derided. But Diogenes saw this as his rightful place, because to do otherwise would be contributing to a society he saw as ridiculous. It also allowed him to lob his criticisms at the city-states of Greece without the faintest hint of hypocrisy. Diogenes had purposefully set himself apart from the object of his ire. As we will explore later, he himself was the model of his own philosophy. He demonstrated how fragile Athenian and Corinthian society's expectations were by living apart from them and being totally fine. And why did Diogenes do all of this? Well, it is largely because, just like money, he saw social status as a trap that ensnares our freedom. When we play a certain societal role, we're essentially agreeing to do certain things and refrain from doing other things. On the extreme end, if I were to become the king of the United Kingdom tomorrow, I would give up the right to have any public political opinions. And someone who is considered a pillar of the community can't very well go and get themselves involved in a sex scandal, or else they will lose 
against their position. In some ways, Diogenes might not object to people freely making this decision, but he urged them to see it as a choice and one that was not obligatory. Like Jean-Paul Sartre would argue thousands of years later, we are condemned to be free. And the totality of what we could do is borderline terrifying. So we happily pretend to be less free by believing that we are metaphysically trapped in a certain societal role. Diogenes is an example of someone who simply refused to play this game, and so he represents an alternative way of living, in both deed and word. And in some ways, we today have upheld a lot of Diogenes' critique. After all, we too reject the mores of Athenian society. We no longer practice ostracism or slavery or relegate women to the role of second-class citizens. Of course, Diogenes would also turn his critical eye to our world and ask where our own conventions are either arbitrary or irrational. And whether you are a budding political radical or just someone who wants to participate in society with their eyes firmly open, we can all learn a lot from this ancient bad-mouthed philosopher. Of course, with his criticism of society came an important extra spice. And that is just our next point. 3. Shamelessness in the UK, shameless is about as harsh an insult a so-called well-to-do person can throw at someone. It is meant to signal an individual out as so morally corrupt, so out of touch with all that is right and just, that they don't even have the decency to feel ashamed at their sorry state. American philosopher Eve Sedgwick has talked at length about the role shame has in making people police their own behaviour even when no one is watching. On the other hand, someone like Gabriel Marcel described shame as a possibly corrective mechanism that has the potential to lead us away from unethical lives. Diogenes' philosophy on this is worth exploring because of its stark radicalism. He simply does not have any shame. We read numerous accounts of his shameless actions. He touches himself inappropriately in public, defecates in the street, insults passers-by, and howls vulgarities at the wealthy and the wise. Having heard Plato's definition of a human as a featherless biped, he famously insulted this highly respected philosopher by showing up at the academy with a freshly plucked chicken, shouting, Behold, a man. It was like he simply did not feel the societal pull that keeps the rest of us in check. This is also part of what allowed him to endure his extreme poverty. Since he did not feel any shame at being seen as dirty or vulgar, he could sit quite happily in the Athenian sun, reportedly stinking to high heavens, and enjoying the effect this had on any judgmental passers-by. This is another example of him emulating what he saw as animalistic behaviour. A dog feels no shame when it urinates in the street, so why should we? Any other school of ancient philosophy might have argued that we are more intelligent than animals, and so we've constructed rational systems to make our lives easier and more orderly. But as we've said, Diogenes saw all of these systems as freedom-restricted, shame-generating machines. So he will crap in the street all he wants, thank you very much, and he'll tell all of the great ethical philosophers in history to shove it. This is is not to say that Diogenes had no principles, it's just that his principles were in accordance with this societal shamelessness. His ethical system was to live like an animal, to remain brutally authentic and honest, and to reject anything that would limit his liberty, or the liberty of other people. Shame would take him further away from all three of these goals. It's tempting here to paint Diogenes' philosophy as almost sociopathic, but I think that's a caricature. The cynics valued not harming people physically, and they valued free choice and consent as almost universal rights. It's just that for Diogenes, shame seemed to do the opposite of this. He saw it as a force which compelled people to make decisions under duress, shun others for no good reason, and attack our fellow man to shift the ever-glowing eye of shame from our doorstep. And it is worth taking these criticisms seriously, even if we don't want to follow them quite as far as Diogenes did. Shame has wrought terrible havoc over human psyches for generations. It has influenced us to repress some of our deepest feelings, to discriminate based on arbitrary factors, and to uphold cruel moral systems that have killed or hurt countless people. It might also turn out to be a necessary component to the glue that holds a society together. I obviously can't solve this issue here, I'm just a bloke with some books. But if we can learn to be a little bit more like Diogenes, and at the very least start to control our sense of shame, then we will undoubtedly increase our overall freedom. Or, to quote an internet meme I once saw, to be cringe is to be free. This lack of shame is also a great help in cultivating that nebulous yet prized possession, authenticity.
That is, honesty with ourselves and others about our beliefs and desires. How many of us have aspects that we personally value, yet feel unable to show to other people? Perhaps we are scared to reveal a vulnerable side of ourselves to our friends, or open up to our partner about something that has deeply hurt us. Feeling ashamed to such things can add to a terrifying sense of isolation, and give us the impression that no one truly knows us, and if they did, they would hate us. Being rid of such shame can arguably broaden our horizons to the radically open world that lies stretched before us. Dargenes certainly seemed to think so. What would you do if you genuinely did not care what other people thought? Would you quit your job and live off the grid? Would you start a whole new life leaving only a note behind? Would you decide to donate all of your possessions and become a monk? Upon reflection, you might realize that everything is already as it should be and you're quite happy with your life. But according to Diogenes, you'll never know what you truly want until you shake free of shame. For it is propriety's watchman who keeps a close eye not just on your actions, but on your thoughts and desires as well. But we are not done with Diogenes yet. Now I want to turn to what his broader approach tells us about different ways of doing philosophy, and how we can learn to balance them. 4. The Critical Instinct A common phrase is, everyone's a critic, and Diogenes certainly was. We actually know very little of his positive philosophy, though he did reportedly have one. He wrote many books, including one entitled The Republic, which painted his idea of a perfect society. But much of this seems to have been a rejection of what Athenians thought was the right way to run a state. He allegedly said that there would be almost no sexual taboos, provided that there was consent, and that some of the most important rituals in ancient Greece would be overturned. Unlike pretty much any other philosopher of his time, he was totally unconcerned with what the gods did. He saw religious institutions as an impediment to human independence and advised that they be dispensed with. Of the fragments of his work and his aphorisms that survive, he seems to give a lot more harsh criticism than positive advice. We start to get a picture of a man stood on the sidelines of society, hurling abuse from his ceramic pot. It's easy to fool ourselves into thinking that Diogenes is pathetic in this position. Someone whose philosophy is is just a violent reaction to more dominant strains of thought. But I would argue that even if this is true, a harsh contrarian instinct amongst the old philosopher is actually not necessarily a bad thing. And maybe we could use a sprinkle of it ourselves. I want to highlight three cognitive biases that a cynic philosophy is well placed to combat. First is the famous confirmation bias, which is the tendency we have to seek out evidence that confirms our pre-existing beliefs, rather than that which refutes them. The second is de-individuation, which is a complex psychological phenomenon, but partly refers to our tendency to outsource our personal responsibility when many other people around us believe the same thing, or we are in a crowd. And the third is the repetition bias. That is, when we believe something is true simply because it's been repeated to us an awful lot, rather than that we have any evidence for it. Together, these can form a sort of rock wall that prevents our thinking from evolving, either individually or collectively. If you think about the people you know, how many of them have views that line up almost perfectly with the people they spend the most time with? Or we could reflect on how much of the internet has split off into isolated echo chambers, where there is precious little challenge of the group's dominant view to be found. This is where Diogenes comes in. A semi-malignant and incisive critic who almost instinctively takes the opposing view to whatever the majority are saying, perfectly placed to shock any group of people who have become too comfortable with their own views. Plato once described Diogenes as the mad Socrates. He meant it as an insult, but I actually think it's a rather apt description. Whereas Socrates was a master of polite and civil challenge, Diogenes's use of witticisms and harsh language meant that he could not be ignored. He is the thorn in the side of conventional thinking, the supreme advocate of the devil itself, and the irritant of anyone just trying to have a pleasant conversation with their mates. And this is, in some ways, an incredibly valuable valuable role. Without such brave and annoying contrarians, we would be much more at risk of drifting off into autopilot, losing the ability to step out of our first-person perspective and see the world with fresh eyes. We could slowly become like Kierkegaard's herd, all parroting the same doctrine with no idea why we believe it or what its impact should be. It is no wonder that so many people heaped abuse on Diogenes. He was said to often have visible bruises from where someone he had criticized had struck him. He had so many assailants he started wearing their names around his neck. 
And this is kind of predictable. It is so much more comfortable just to sit back and reinforce your own views than to have them ridiculed and attacked by a half-naked, slightly smelly wanderer. It's worth noting that it was only many years after his death that people truly began to revere Diogenes. That is, when they had no risk of encountering him themselves. Of course, a society full of these contrarian critics would be a disaster. There would be no cohesion, no unity, only endless suspicion and intolerable originality. But nonetheless, a few sprinkled here and there might do us some good. So the next time you encounter a Diogenes-like figure in your own life, it's worth bearing in mind what we get out of the deal. They might be rude, obnoxious, and odious, but in some sense, we're better off with them than without them. Well, provided we see the value in Diogenes' approach. But there is one thing that continues to drive people's respect for this ancient cynic sage, and it's a view of philosophy that we could all benefit from. 5. Practice and Preaching I will always remember the basics of how an ionic bond works in chemistry. When I was 14, we were learning about how when you put sodium in water, ionic bonds form between the hydrogen, oxygen, and sodium atoms, and that this releases a lot of energy in the process. If I had just been told that, it probably would have left my memory pretty quickly. But instead, my teacher dropped a piece of sodium in a beaker, and it proceeded to explode in its own small way. The demonstration imparted why the information was significant, what a release in energy amounted to, and the drama served to etch this into my memory forevermore. And Diogenes did the exact same thing with cynic philosophy. How many people do you know who will lob criticisms at a given way of life without changing an iota of their own behaviour? Who will rail against the luxuries of modern society from their four-bedroom house? Or complain about how people can't just have a calm conversation anymore while hurling abuse at those they disagree with? Most people have an instinctive dislike like of this sort of hypocrisy, and at the very least it renders someone's point a bit less convincing. It shows that they might not be that confident in their point, otherwise they would be practicing what they preached. Of course, this doesn't mean that they're actually wrong, it just means they're less convincing to other people. This was one reason why Diogenes thought so little of Plato. Plato would harshly criticize the governments of city-states while entertaining the dictator of Syracuse. Diogenes described him as all words, no deeds, and saw him as the false heir of Socrates' more grounded philosophical approach. No such charge of hypocrisy could be laid at the feet of Diogenes. He said we should devalue material possessions, and so he lived on the street, owning only the staff and the cloak on his back. He saw no distinction between the high and mighty and the poor and lowly, so he treated everyone equally even when that puts him at great risk. He believed that humans had a lot to learn from dogs, so he emulated the behavior of dogs. Diogenes was a living, breathing example of his own philosophy. And this is partly what earned him the begrudging respect of some Athenians. Legend has it that when a cruel young man broke the jar Diogenes lived in, the city voted to supply him with a new one. And on this point, I think Diogenes would find a lot to criticize about many of us, myself very much included. Most of us have stated explicit principles that purport to guide our lives. We might follow a religion or a certain ethical system or even just tout hedonistic ideals. But do we actually live as these principles would dictate? Do we truly follow our moral code or only when it's convenient? Are we really Christians or Buddhists or atheists or do we only profess to be? Do we claim to only care about ourselves but when the time comes for action we're actually quite selfless, maybe even kind? If so, Diogenes would point his bow bony finger directly at us, and remind us that unless we want hypocrite stamped on our forehead, we better bring our philosophy in line with our actions, or our actions in line with our philosophy. Otherwise, what are we even doing philosophy for? If you want more on ancient thinking, then check out this video on Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, and how, amongst other things, it is the best self-help book in history. And stick around for more on thinking to improve your life.